volcanoes, one of the classic geohazards. Commonly reported as remorseless sources of lava that threaten life and property, such as on La Palma or Iceland, and made famous by Hollywood, perhaps for the wrong reasons. A greater hazard comes not from lava, but what gets erupted into the atmosphere. Voluminous ash, which can rain down to carpet the ground. But it's not just about the area around the volcano. Some eruptions can impact the whole planet, and the greatest of these are called super eruptions. OK, they can be misrepresented as firework shows, but the story of super eruptions is linked to the near demise of humanity almost as soon as Homo sapiens began to migrate out of Africa. The link between volcanic super eruptions and existential threats to all of humanity really took off during the Cold War. The impacts of cataclysmic nuclear war were predicted not just to kill people straight after detonation, but to generate devastating longer term climatic effects, nuclear winter. And for some, a test of the nuclear winter hypothesis could come from a proxy, from volcanic super eruptions. And the big eruption was from the volcano Toba that deposited its so-called Younger Toba Tuff around 73 to 74,000 years ago. It was broadly synchronous with what was known as the bottleneck in the dispersion of modern humans across Southeast Asia and a corresponding crash in population numbers. Was a volcanic winter a proxy for a nuclear winter? But was the volcanic eruption quite so cataclysmic? Are volcanic winters global disasters? It's time to check out the geology and visit Ground Zero, the caldera on Sumatra. Like many calderas, it's now partially filled by a lake, a tourist attraction and a geopark. Before getting into Toba and its eruption 73, 74 thousand years ago, let's step forward in time and lower in intensity and look at two other eruptions around this part of the Ring of Fire. The 1991 eruption of Pinatubo, close to Manila in the Philippines, it erupted vast clouds of ash that carpeted the environs across the region. Imaged in early satellite monitoring, seen in the infrared spectra. So the eruption plume could be mapped encircling the Earth. Pinatobo was important to climate scientists in the 1990s and gave credence to the volcanic winter notion. It was, on a geological scale, quite a small eruption, with an estimated eruption of five cubic kilometres of magma and rock. Next, we go back to 1815 and Tambora. There's been quite a lot of research on the global impacts of Tambora's 1815 eruption, especially losing art. The red skies in the Northern Hemisphere caused by aerosols, thought to inspire Turner amongst many other artists. Closer to the volcano, ash thicknesses have been mapped out across this corner of Southeast Asia. Deposits of up to five centimetres thick accumulated over 1,000 kilometres away from the volcano. But fine ash and aerosols spread around the world, linked to 1816's Year Without Summer. The climatic effects have been mapped out with mean temperature drops of up to 2 degrees centigrade. In New York, for example, there are extensive snowfalls in June. This map shows the impact on island communities, which have limited resilience. But across this, there were disasters everywhere, from huge floods in China, recurrent harvest failures and famine in India, and in Europe, food riots, a volcanic winter, but one from which communities recovered over a few years. Tambora was significantly bigger than the 1991 eruption of Pinatubo. To make comparisons, volcanologists use the Volcanic Explosivity Index, VEI, that peaks at 8+. plus. 
Each step represents an order of magnitude increase in the volume of ejector, reported as a dense rock volume, which is the material before it was dispersed as ash. So, Pinatubo 1991 was VEI 6 and Tambora a 7. There are lots of other criteria for assigning a VEI, but for global climate impacts, it's chiefly about understanding how ejector and gases get into the upper atmosphere and the big events of VEI 8 plus. So let's go to Toba, estimated to erupted around 73 to 74,000 years ago. Its dense rock equivalent was a huge 28,000 cubic kilometers. Some estimates place it up at 33,000. So let's go back to Toba. We haven't really looked at how big the Toba caldera is. It's huge. Let's compare it with some other geography. This is Greater London and beyond. It's orbital motorway, the M25. And this is Toba's footprint. Huge. So let's see what came out of the caldera. And first consider the ash. It has the most obvious geological record as it makes physical deposits. The younger Toba Tuff has been mapped across this region, encountered in marine boreholes around the Indian Ocean and on shore. So this is a metre thickness plus. 10 centimetres and 1 centimetre. It's been found in the cores of sediments in Lake Malawi in Africa. So this collectively gets us to the dense rock equivalent of 2,800 cubic kilometres. But for climate, it's not really about the ash deposit. Volcanoes emit a lot of gas. Consider the SO2. In the atmosphere, it oxidises to form SO4 ions which make aerosols of sulfuric acid, estimated in huge volumes. These aerosols fall out in precipitation and so are recorded in ice cores in Antarctica and here, Greenland. This is a high resolution record in years. And before the Toba eruption, sulfuric acid aerosols could be tracked at this concentration in the core, around 200 parts per billion but it shoots up to almost 2,000 ppb. The record of high emissions from Toba and high concentrations in the global atmosphere. So what? Well, these aerosols can act to reflect sunlight, greatly reducing its transmission to the Earth's surface. Dark, dark days. Some estimate that daytime light intensities would have fallen to nighttime values, too dark for photosynthesis and correspondingly much cooler, a volcanic winter. But aspects of this view are challenged, as the aerosols could serve as greenhouse gases and act to insulate the Earth's surface, from an insulation perspective, if not from the light intensity. So not necessarily so cold, but still really gloomy. A critical factor in this seems to be the droplet size of the aerosols, and this is a matter of ongoing research. Taking the temperature with a slight pinch of salt, this is one climate model for Toba, with global temperature and precipitation both crashing in the year following the Toba eruption. So what about us and our ancestors? The impacts on early humanity need not just be about climate, but also about ash. So a brief history. Modern humans 150,000 years ago are restricted to Africa, with migrations out into India and Southeast Asia by 75,000 years ago. Then the Tobra eruption. And the so-called human bottleneck theory says that human populations were reduced by the eruption to just a few thousand individuals surviving in the sanctuary of Africa. But over recent years, archaeology is giving a different perspective, with surviving 
even flourishing communities in India, China and even on Sumatra itself. And of course, population expansion and migration has continued since. So it looks like Homo sapiens as a species is pretty resilient to super eruptions. Back to that climate model. And the forecast is that in the course of a generation, global conditions return to pre-eruption states. The bad times of global winter, cold and dry conditions, lasted perhaps five or six years. Though, of course, this type of modelling carries significant uncertainties. Certainly, in the Greenland ice core, sulfuric acid aerosols look to have been flushed from the atmosphere quite quickly. And as a consequence of all this new work, research papers in the past 20 years or so have stressed the idea of continuity of humanity and human occupation at sites even close to Toba. How was this achieved? Well, maybe by changes in diet and increased use of seafood. It's very much up for investigation. For sure, such super eruptions would have been more than a mild inconvenience. Certainly, an eruption of the magnitude that deposited the YTT would have devastating impacts on food supply today, both from ash and from aerosols. Perhaps humans can geoengineer away the threat by adjusting volcanic plumbing systems. It's been proposed for Yellowstone. But what about other volcanoes prone to super eruptions? For sure, any future major eruption that's anywhere like as big as Toba would be devastating for communities, disproportionately so for those with limited resilience. Super eruptions, even though they don't necessarily cause mass extinctions, certainly are a major, perhaps the greatest, geohazard.